Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Smith. Tonight we have, as Deacon Sabatino said, a great topic, the Gospel of Mark, so I want to dive right in with you. What I want to do is, um, this week and next, is share with you what I think is a very fresh and very catechetical, right from the catechism, very catechetical approach to getting even more depth and meaning out of the gospel. So I'm going to teach you a little insight that comes right from the catechism. That'll be in just a short while. But to start with, I thought it would be good if we get a nice primer on how to approach all four gospels as a Catholic today. So if you look at the top of your outline, the gospel of Mark, the lion roars, part one. Uh, And let's talk about some things that are crucial for every Catholic in order to properly pray and study all four Gospels. So these are going to be seven points fairly quickly, but follow along with me if you can. The first point, Deacon Sabatino already teed this up nicely for us. The Gospels, all four Gospels, are of both divine and human authorship. This was one of the major um, teachings of Vatican II and Dei Verbum reminding us what the church has always taught and taught and continues to teach that the gospels are conveyed come to us through the inspired holy spirit but also through the human authors so as it says on the page and this is actually a quote from dei verbum the church has always and everywhere held and i love the way it phrases this and continues to hold lest there be no debate, right, that the church has somehow weakened its stance on the inspiration of the sacred scriptures. The church has always held and continues to hold that the four gospels are of apostolic origin. What the apostles preached afterwards, they themselves and apostolic men, we'll come to that term in a moment, under the inspiration of the divine spirit, the Holy Spirit, handed on to us in writing the foundation of faith. That's what the Gospels are. That's why we stand, right, at Mass, right, in Divine Liturgy. We stand when the Gospels are proclaimed because they are the foundation of our faith. And then it names them, right, the fourfold Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as I said tonight, we're going to focus on the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark. Thank you. Dealing with a little bit of Jerusalem jet lag, but we'll get there. They're the product of eyewitness testimony. Listen to what Luke says about that very manner of writing. He starts his gospel out this way. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, and there he's talking about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were, notice this, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He says, It seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past, he doesn't say how long, to write an orderly account for you, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. And so this prologue of Luke's gospel has been studied by theologians over uh, the centuries, and more recently there's been some studies done on the very language that's used in the Greek. And the long and short of it is, that Luke is conveying to us something of what I would call his methodology. He's saying, I wasn't interested in secondhand stories. I was interested in firsthand living witnesses, living accounts. So when you read Luke's gospel, it's like you're peering over the shoulder of Luke the physician, Luke the reporter, Luke the investigator, and Luke the evangelist, who went and talked to the people who are in his gospel. Now, when I Uh, share that, sometimes people will ask me, well, does that mean that St. Luke talked to the Blessed Virgin Mary? And the the answer is, we we don't know. We don't know whether it was he talked to the Blessed Virgin Mary. A lot of it depends upon his geographic location um, and where she was at the time, right? Her bodily assumption. There's a lot of questions that we we just don't have the clear answers for. 
But I can guarantee you this, if he didn't talk to the Blessed Virgin Mary, he sure as heck talked to someone who knew her very, very well. Otherwise, why can Luke say not once but twice in, the, in his gospel, Mary pondered these things in her heart? Where would he get that information from? There's only two possibilities. The first one we can't entertain, that he simply made it up because it sounds good, right? The other possibility, the only possibility is that someone had a conversation with him. And when he asked her, well, tell me about Mary, that came up, that Mary was very prayerful. You know, Mary was always praying about these things. Same thing later in Luke's gospel in chapter 8, we have the story of uh, a man, Jairus, whose daughter was raised back to life by Jesus. Well, that was Jairus' own little gospel. As far as we know, Jairus never wrote a gospel, certainly not in the scriptures, right? But that was his little ouangelion, his gospel. Whenever you'd go to his house, he would tell you the story of what happened to his beloved daughter and how our Savior raised her back to life. Okay, so that is to say that Luke is giving us a little bit of a method for understanding how not just he but all four evangelists composed their Gospels. They were intimately involved in Jesus' own life. Two of the evangelists, Matthew and John, were part of his own company of the Twelve for three years. Now, we have to talk for a moment just about... um, St. Luke and St. Mark, because technically speaking, they're not apostles, but they have the term in the catechism, apostolic men. Apostolic men means technically they weren't in the company of Jesus as the 12 were, right? Luke and, and Mark were not part of the 12, but their credentials are absolutely gold standard. Let's take Luke, since we've been talking about him. Luke, as we know from biblical testimony as well as beyond the Bible, was a traveling companion Tradition says a physician, Luke's uh, St. Paul's own traveling physician. So he traveled with St. Paul, who himself met the risen Lord. So he's more than qualified, right? And then Mark, according to tradition, or John Mark, um, is or was the companion of St. Peter. Now, some will call Mark Peter's secretary. And I just don't like that term, all right? Mark wasn't a secretary in the sense of just writing things down like a stenographer, right? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, like all the apostles, right? He was given the charge to compose for us that eyewitness testimony so that we can treasure it and live by it even today. Now, um, there's both internal evidence and external evidence that supports that the people who wrote the Gospels, that is to say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually wrote them. And the reason I only have to say this to you, I know you believe this, but we live in a world where people don't even, don't even think that the Gospels were written by people who knew our Lord Jesus Christ, right? They're, they're, they're very skeptical today. Many are, have considered the Bibles just, you know, fairy tales and myths. So we've already looked at the internal evidence. There it is from Luke's Gospel. He talks about how he himself was bound and determined to get the straight story from people who actually encountered Jesus, all four Gospels, while, while they don't name themselves, they're very, very humble, right? While they don't name themselves, there is ample evidence beyond this particular quote here that the persons who wrote those Gospels had a, a level of intimacy and knowledge that they couldn't have gotten without being very, very close to Jesus for a period of time. But what about when you step outside the Bible? Well, there is tons of evidence, and literally I do mean tons, from early witnesses, the early patristic writers, and you're going to soon have a series on the patristics, uh, like this quote from St. Irenaeus. Let's read it together. After our Lord rose from the dead, the apostles were invested with power from on high when the Holy Spirit came down. They had perfect knowledge. That's his way of saying inspiration, right? Perfect knowledge, inspiration, completely trustworthy. He says, they departed to the ends of the earth, preached the glad tidings, that is to say, the gospel, the good news. Now watch this. Matthew issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. That's what St. Irenaeus tells us. Now, we know the gospels are written in Greek, but we've got to contend with this. Irenaeus is saying, no, 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 before we have a a Greek uh, text of the gospel, Matthew wrote in Hebrew. Now, there's some debate as to whether he means Hebrew specifically or possibly Aramaic, which was, you know, the language Jesus spoke. And um, sometimes Hebrew and Aramaic are so close that he may have substituted the word Hebrew and really actually meant Aramaic, which is a kind of a a dialect or a derivation. It's a separate language, but it's very close to to Hebrew. It's like Spanish and Portuguese, right? It shares the same alphabet and so on. So in any case, that's what he's telling us. Very interesting information. Then he says, while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome in the 60s A.D., and laying the foundations of the church, 
After their departure, here we go, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, handed down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. So you see that relationship between um, the apostolic man Mark and the apostle Peter. St. Irenaeus calls Mark the interpreter of, and also disciple of Peter. So this is firsthand knowledge from Peter himself. And it's very interesting when you read Mark's gospel. Earlier, Deacon was talking about his own experience of it. My experience of it is when I read Mark's gospel, it's like Peter shines through in so many ways. And hopefully we'll see that as we study it. There's so many ways in which, of course, all four gospels, he's prominent and prime and all that. But in some ways, he just kind of shines through in a particular way in Mark. Well, could that be because Mark had spent so much time with Peter getting his particular nuance on the life of Jesus Christ from him personally. Then he goes on and says, Luke, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. And then it says, afterwards, meaning last, right, John, the disciple of the Lord, who had also leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. I would just want to add one other comment about John. Um. John gives us a different flavor to the ministry of Jesus Christ, right? He only takes, for example, the seven signs or miracles. He doesn't include the Lord's Prayer, doesn't include the Sermon on the Mount. And there's lots of questions how John relates to the other three synoptic Gospels. Um, And I don't think I have this quote on your outline, uh, but Eusebius, the church historian, says something amazing about John. Um, I remember first reading this to my shame, only in my doctoral program. And I'm like, the bells went off. I'm like, oh my gosh, now I understand better from Eusebius how John relates to the Synoptic Gospels. And here's the paraphrase. Eusebius writes that John had access to the other three Gospels, which were written before him, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But he goes on to say, Eusebius, that John wrote to give us a longer account of Jesus' ministry the first two years of Jesus' ministry prior to the year that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, that's very, very helpful information because what Eusebius is saying is, hey, look, what you're looking at in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is essentially one year, the final year of Jesus' ministry. And you know what? Eusebius is absolutely right because when you read the Gospels, you see that everything culminates right in Holy Week at the Passover, Well, the Passover fell in March or April of every year. There's one Passover in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's in the end of their Gospels, right, where you get the Jesus entering into Jerusalem and the Holy Week and the arrest, trial, scourging, crucifixion, uh, uh, resurrection, ascension, all of it, right? But in John's Gospel, there are actually three Passovers. Right after the wedding feast of Cana in chapter 2, in chapter 6, the so-called Bread of Life Discourse, and then in chapter 12 through the end is the third one. Well, that means that what you have is a three-year ministry in John's gospel, where you have more or less about one year in the synoptics. That's also very, very helpful information to know. So my point here is we have got tremendous um, data, both from the gospels themselves, but also from beyond the gospels, early credible church history data that tells us a lot about who these people were, why they wrote, how they wrote, and what order they wrote. And I think that's very, very important. It's very important for Catholics to know, to remind ourselves, that we don't read the Scripture with the Scripture alone. We read through the heart of the church. We must contend with that. We, we don't read simply as individuals. We always read from this larger standpoint of the church's body of truth, sacred tradition. Okay? Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is that the Bible really comes to us, and the Gospels in particular, come to us from a Eucharistic core. As I say, point number two, from the Eucharist, the Bible. Here's what I mean. The Gospels were composed, as we know, as we just said, by the apostles. Well, who were the apostles? Crucial members, right, of Jesus' own company. Crucial members of the church, In a sense, they were the church, right? The very beginnings of the church. Well, who did they write to? Say, well, to anyone who would hear, but essentially who they wrote to was the church. So we could say that the Gospels were composed by the church and for the church. Confused? Hopefully not, right? The the point is to see that 
All of this is taking place in this embryo of truth called the ecclesia, the early church. And the early church was never, ever, ever without the Holy Eucharist at her very core of worship. And so in other words, when we want to understand what the Gospels are trying to convey to us, what they're teaching us, how they're trying to shape our lives, we can never separate the words of Mark or any other Gospel apart from the liturgy. Vatican II said this many times in many ways, right, that word and sacrament go together. But it's always been that way. Vatican II didn't sort of make that up. It's always been that way from the beginning. And let me give you some quotes to back that up. Um, Turn to Luke chapter 22 in your Bibles, if you would. I know it's on the page, but I want you to open your Bibles and use them and read them. It's the best way to become familiar with these texts. Luke chapter 22, this is right in the middle of what's known as the institution narrative, right? All three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have an institution narrative, an institution of the Eucharist. Here's the key phrase from Luke's gospel that I want to point out to you on this relation between Eucharist and Bible. These are Jesus' words. Um, Likewise, also, the cup after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, I heard some of you axiomatically saying with me covenant, which is perfectly fine. Did it shock you to hear new testament? You say, well, wait a minute. The new testament is, is this, is the book. The new covenant is this relationship, it's the Eucharist. Well, actually, the only time Jesus utters the phrase new testament, only once, he's not referring to a book but to the cup of his blood, the Holy Eucharist. And I actually included it for you here in the Greek. I meant to include a transliterated version, but it's the underline there. Kainai diatheke, new covenant, right? And on the next page is the Vulgate version, right? Novum Testamentum. If you actually buy a Latin uh, Vulgate of the New Testament, that's what it's actually called, Novum Testamentum. What's the point? The point is that from the very beginnings of Jesus' proclamation of the gospel, the very first time in Scripture he talks about the New Testament, he's referring to the new covenant of his blood. In other words, as it says in the outline, we move from sacrament to book. Now, I want to be clear. I've given my life to teaching this book. I love the Holy Scriptures. So this is not about in any way diminishing or downgrading the Holy Scriptures. It's simply to get the order right, that we come to the Scriptures through the liturgy, whether it's in uh, the time of Jesus or it's today, right? The liturgy, the liturgy is, it, the, the Scriptures come forth from the sacred liturgy. Here's a nice quote uh, from Dr. Scott Hahn, who says, What the first Christians knew as the New Testament was not a book. Let's not forget that the New Testament canon does not come together until the 300s, until its final form. It's it's gelling early on, believe me, by the first century. The Gospels are there, the fourfold Gospel, Paul's letters. But before it's kind of ratified, codified, and all that, it's a couple hundred years. They weren't waiting around for that, right? They had the New Testament, right? They consumed it every Sunday morning. What the first Christians knew or embraced as the New Testament, was not a book, but the Eucharist. It is not that the Scripture has somehow been demoted, he says. It is rather that the New Testament subordinates the document to the sacrament. So I sometimes get the question from some who will say, uh, Dr. Smith, is this, uh, is this the Word of God? And I'll say, well, of course it's the Word of God. Right? This is the Holy Bible. It's the inspired Word of God. But the Word of God is not limited to this book, right? It is the eternal Word of God. Remember in Genesis, God speaks forth His Word. His Word is not bound by this book. It is that God beautifully condescends to us to send His Son to earth in the incarnation, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He proclaims the Word of God. The living Word of God proclaims the Word of God. And this book embodies and preserves that faithful, true, and living witness of Jesus Christ. 
So again, it's not to in any way diminish the Word of God, it's to rightly understand the relationship between the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Scriptures. They're bound together, they were from the very beginning. Here's one more quote on this topic from um, someone who's actually on the Pontifical Biblical Commission, uh, Brother Dennis Farkas Valvi. He writes, it was in a Eucharistic cradle, I love that phrase, right? A Eucharistic cradle of early Christianity, of early Christian worship, excuse me, that the Synoptic Gospels were formed and shaped in live exchange with an audience assembled for hearing about Jesus. Precisely because the early Christians wanted to meet Jesus by means of these assemblies, after all, they did so at pain of injury or death, right? And see their previous encounters reenacted, renewed, and relived. They recalled and retold their past experiences with Jesus while consuming the only cultic meal that the early church has ever had the celebration of the Eucharist. And so we can say that the Holy Scriptures, the New, the New Testament in particular, the Holy Gospels, right, are the Word of God that proceed to us from the sacrament of God, from the side of Jesus Christ. It's also important, this is the next point down on the page, to understand that while the Bible was written by the church, by the apostles, and in this Eucharistic liturgy, they were composed for the church primarily. In fact, if you look at the early church fathers, whenever they would deal with the Gnostics and the heretics, they would always just kind of write them off and say, they don't have any credibility to proclaim what these, uh, what these texts mean because they're not part of the church. And that sounds kind of very, just kind of, you know, brush it away, but it, it was just common sense to them. If you're, not, if you're not part of this mystery of the Eucharist and of the believing, how can you possibly say what these texts mean? It's very important, though, to understand that there's this beautiful relationship between the apostles who proclaim the truths and the audience who receives it. In some sense, and I'm on the outline here, the shape of and to some degree the contents of the Gospels was developed out of this, what I call this ecclesial give and take. Meaning before it's written down in these Eucharistic assemblies, the evangelists are proclaiming the Word of God and people are hearing it and being, as Farkas Falvey says, renewed, restored, revived. Here's a question. To what degree did the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tailor their message for their audience? Now, that's actually a very big question, which I can't really fully answer here. It's got a lot of pieces to it. But I would say it's certainly true, and the Catechism affirms this. Yes, to some degree they did. They weren't writing just for faceless people. They were writing to people that they knew and loved. It's also important in in making that point that we don't um, overestimate the role of the audiences. Um, It's been very much in vogue in the 20th century to talk about how it was really the audiences, not the apostles, but the audiences who drove the story of what the Gospels ultimately became. And that, my dear friends, I would say is something to be cautious about when you hear that it was... um, you know, the German phrase is the Sitzenleben, which means the setting in life in which the gospel was emerged and formed and shaped. Um, it, it's kind of like this. My analogy is you have a, a stand-up comedian, right? And he, he goes out to his audience and he tests his material, right? And the audience doesn't laugh at this, but they laugh at that. And before you know it, his whole act has changed based upon what they think is funny and what they need and all that. Well, we can't really look at the gospels and that's through that sort of lens. By a give and take, I mean that it was those evangelists who proclaimed the Jesus story faithfully to the audiences. And they did so with an eye on what the churches needed. But we should be careful not to distort the picture to say that it was the audience that drove, uh, that, that drove the story. That would be putting the cart before the horse. And the Pontifical Biblical Commission is a nice warning about it. Let's read it. It says, The truth of the gospel account is not comprised because the evangelists report the Lord's words and deeds in different order. Some scholars deny, as it were, the historical nature and historical value of the Gospels. Now, here it comes. Finally, some minimize the authority of the apostles as witnesses to Christ, belittling their office and their influence in the early Christian community. These scholars exaggerate 
the creative power of the community itself. Now, that was from a text taken in 1965, right before Vatican II, uh, and spot on. The, 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 the PBC is basically saying, hey, yeah, there's a give and take. All right, I've already established that, but we want to be careful to always preference the apostles as those individual authors. Okay, I don't want to beat that to death, but it's important because some people have this impression that it was really a committee that wrote the Gospels, right, or that sort of thing, and that's not at all the case. Okay, um, nice quote here from Richard Baucom. He says, uh, the church did not remember Jesus in the same sense as Peter did, but in a secondary sense that could not be uh, real were it not rooted in the recollective memories of Peter and the others. What he's saying there is simply that, again, it's, it's not as though somehow this was developed or concocted out of some symbiotic relationship of all the people getting together and remembering Jesus. It was indeed the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who preserved the words and under the divine Holy Spirit. As far as we know, the community wasn't under that same rubric. They weren't, certainly weren't as the apostles were. It was them who gave us the truth of the Gospels, okay? All right, enough on that. A third point, let's talk about a little bit about the dating of the Gospels. Um, a lot of people have questions about the dating. When were the Gospels written? And there is certainly some, uh, some room for flexibility, but also some, some important uh, borders that we have to keep in mind. Obviously, we know that Jesus was crucified in 30 or 33 AD, there's some debate about the dating there, but we know, let's just, let's just call 33 AD that traditional year, right? Okay, well, if that's the case, then when were the Gospels actually composed? Well, I have for you at the bottom what I think are very uh, reasonable, safe dates for when the Gospels were composed. There's both a majority view, which I'll talk about, and a minority view. The majority view today is the view of most scholars, both Catholic and Protestant, and it kind of goes like this. They would suggest that Mark was the earliest gospel. That's very, very popular in a lot of societies and academic social circles, as well as many universities, so that it overturns the order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by placing Mark first. And in questions later, if you want to talk about that, I can give you, I hope, a short answer why people say Mark was first and not Matthew. Uh, But that would be in the 60s or 70s, and then Matthew and Luke following in the 70s and 80s, and then finally John, 90 to 100. Now, there are some who hold a different view and perspective on this, um, more of a minority, but they would say that um, Matthew is still very probably the first written gospel, that Luke followed, that Mark was the third gospel, a kind of a... um, um, hybrid between Matthew's Jewish audience and Luke's kind of more Greek audience, and then finally John, okay? That would change the dating slightly, but we're still talking about a period between roughly the 50s at the earliest for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and to about 90 to 100 for St. John, right? But let's be clear about a couple of things. Regardless of those dates, we're very safely in the first century, right? Um, from the first days of Pentecost, the Gospels are being proclaimed orally, right? And over a period of time, those collections of Jesus' teachings, miracles, deeds, and especially the Passion narrative are being very, very carefully preserved orally and proclaimed in the Eucharistic, Eucharistic liturgies until such point that the apostles begin to gather those together into their final written Gospels somewhere in this time frame. What's most important to note is that none, and I mean none, of the four Gospels were written after this point in time of 90 to 180. In fact, all the Gospels, uh, the Gospel we're considering tonight was clearly written, in my view, somewhere between the 50s to the 70s. Uh, John was written most likely last in the 90s to 100. But in the early 20th century, people had wild ideas that the Gospels were written in the 2nd century or 3rd century. And it's just, it's just based on just wild speculation. There's absolutely no evidence to support that whatsoever. I still hear it all the time. Um, students will say, well, I'll say one of the Gospels written. We'll say, well, time of Constantine or third century, fourth century. No. Uh, we, the earliest fragment we have of the New Testament is about this big. And it's of a small passage in John chapter 18. And it's dated to 125 A.D., 
Okay, so that puts to rest as the latest gospel wild theories that's written in the second, third, fourth century, whenever. And very likely that copy took time to migrate out to where it was found, which was in Egypt, which means if you go back to where John wrote it, you have to erase about 20 years. That puts us back to about 100 AD. Okay. The point I simply want to make is we have to come back to some fundamentals. We trust these Gospels because they're written by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're, they're breathed forth by the Holy Spirit. They're composed by living eyewitnesses. They're written in the heart of the church, for the church. They're composed by the end of the first century. Okay. Point number four, moving a little bit more briskly. For all those reasons and more, the four Gospels are historically accurate and trustworthy. We have total confidence in them. There's a nice quote there from Dei Verbum about how the church has always affirmed and continues to affirm the historicity of the Gospels. Let's also be clear that the Gospels aren't simply timeless truths or nice ideas, right? They are historical documents as well as theological uh, Gospels, right? The church unhesitatingly asserts and affirms that they were handed on from Jesus to the apostles to us today, what he really did and really taught. Fifth point, we're almost done here. There are three stages in which the Gospels were developed, the Catechism says. Very simply, the first stage is Jesus' life and ministry. So that's the first stage, not oral tradition, or it's just Jesus going around the Sea of Galilee teaching. That's the first stage is what he really did. That's him enacting it, doing it, right? That's stage one. Stage two, the oral tradition, probably a period of maybe a decade or two decades before we begin to get some collections of writings. And then the final written Gospels, as I said, we, back in that dating of the latter part of the first century. Um, two more points. Number six, a lot of confusion today about what makes the Gospels in the New Testament unique or distinct from the so-called apocryphal Gospels. And I know some of you probably have done some reading on that. You probably had some stuff here at the Institute, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. There are some critical differences between the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the so-called Apocryphals. This little chart hopefully spells out the basic differences. Very quickly, the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we've been talking about, are written by eyewitness testimony, by the actual individuals known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In contrast, the Apocryphal Gospels, Gospels like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, uh, are not actually composed by those individuals. They couldn't have been because they, those Gospels were written in the third, second, third, or fourth centuries, long after the apostles were dead. And the reason it seems they chose the name like Gospel of Thomas or Gospel of Philip was to give it an air of credibility. But there's no doubt that they were written long after the apostles were dead, so it's a moot point. That's a big critical difference, right? Because whatever is in there, we have to question, well, where do they get their information from? It certainly is not firsthand knowledge. Again, composed in the first century AD versus 200, 300 years after the death of the last apostle. Third, and this is a big one, as we'll see this week and next, the four Gospels tell the Jesus story. Well, that's a, that's a surprising thought. The Gospel tells the story of Jesus, right? But the thing is, when you actually read these apocryphal Gospels, Here's the big surprise most people don't realize. They don't really tell the Jesus story. They don't begin with the baptism, go on to the miracles, and then end up with the passion. They're very esoteric. I'll give you an example. The last statement of the Gospel of Thomas says, and I'm paraphrasing, that it just says Mary must become a man to enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> what? <laughs> You've got to spin around a couple times when you hear that one, right? It's just kind of esoteric Gnostic teaching is not rooted in anything that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking about. And the, the thing is, they're not really interested in the Jesus story at all. They are philosophical Gnostic uh, tracts that aren't rooted really in early Christianity. My guess is that probably somewhere along the line, the, these esoteric communities came in contact with the Christian message, and it kind of developed as a hybrid but heretical teachings, no doubt about it, right? Okay, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. And I always say to people, when you meet people who say, well, have you read the Gospel of Thomas or interested in the Gospel of Judas? I always ask them the basic question, what have you learned from the Gospel of Mark lately? Have you picked up the Gospel of John? Well, no, you know, I hear it in Mass. I'm like, well, just take some time. You, know, you can read through the entire Gospel of Mark in one evening. 
if you have a full evening before a fireplace, about four hours and you're a decent reader, you can get through the whole gospel in about four hours. Amazing, right? Read the four gospels. The last point, and this is the one we're going to deal with tonight and next week, I want to talk about how we can reapproach the Gospels today. We all know and love the Gospels, but is there a way that we can go into them, I don't want to say systematically, but with a, um, with a vigor and with a kind of a, um, an approach that can help us passage by passage? Yes, there is, and it comes from, surprise, surprise, our catechism. Three paragraphs from our catechism I want to share with you, probably we'll have to take a break after I read these, but then we'll get into the actual gospel and see how these work. This next point is the ball game. This is what I want to talk about for the remainder of the time tonight and the next week, what I call the three R's. Okay, these are all found in your catechism in three neat short paragraphs, paragraph 5, 16, 17, and 18. They're all together. Here's the first one. It says... Christ's whole earthly life, that is to say his words, his deeds, his silences, his sufferings, indeed his manner of being and speaking is what the catechism calls revelation from the Father. Revelation. And then it gives this quote, Jesus can say, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And the Father can say, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. That's a quote from the baptism, right? Because our Lord became man in order to do his Father's will, even the least characteristics of his mysteries manifest God's love among us. Okay, here's what that, I think, is saying in simple language. The catechism is saying, no matter what episode you look at in Jesus' life, whether it's, um, you know, the Annunciation to Mary, the Visitation, whether it's uh, the Mustard Seed Parable, Jesus Healing a Paralytic, the Man Born Blind, the Passion Narrative, no matter where you look, if you're in the four Gospels and you have a small passage, there is going to be some measure of revelation, some measure of truth. So it's a basic reminder to say, when you're reading a passage, Lord, what is the heart of the matter here that you want me to see. It's not just a story. It's not just a narrative. There is truth, theology, penetrating our hearts, guiding our minds, leading our lives. What is the truth? And that's the question you can ask. Lord, what is the truth? Okay. And here's the good news. We're going to start looking at passages and asking the question, what appears to be the essential truth? truth or revelation, what's being revealed in this passage. I'm going to give you a number of these so you can get the hang of it and do it on your own, okay? The second R, redemption, redemption. Very next paragraph, Christ's whole life is a mystery of redemption. That's a very profound statement. I'd like us to say it out loud together. Let's say it. Christ's whole life is a mystery of redemption. Now, why I say that's an um, important statement and something of a surprise, because I think many Catholics have a very high view of the crucifixion of Jesus, of the cross. But the Catechism is telling us that his whole life is infused with the mystery of the cross. His whole life is one large act of redemption. In fact, here's what it says. Redemption comes to us above all through the blood of his cross. But then it says the mystery of redemption is at work throughout his entire life. And then it lists five examples so that we get the hang of it. Okay, number one, already in his incarnation. Well, how is the incarnation redemptive? Well, as it goes on to say, in his incarnation, which by becoming poor, he enriches us with his poverty, right? It's like Paul says in Philippians, right? Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a servant or slave, right? So we can study the very incarnation of Jesus Christ. We just went through the Christmas season and see that very action as an act of our redemption. We can go on to his hidden life, point two. By his hidden life, I mean those years in Nazareth that we don't have an account for by the evangelists. By the way, that's not it. There's no sort of secret there. There's no secret life going on. Jesus was submitting himself to, 
in humility to his parents, to, to, jo- to Blessed Joseph and to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Real quickly, number three, in his word, which purifies his hearers. The word of God is redemptive. And number four, in his healings and exorcisms, by which he took our infirmities and diseases. And lastly, number five, by his resurrection. Folks, his entire life is redemptive. Okay, um, so we're talking about these, what I call the three R's in the catechism. First one, revelation. What is the truth that is being revealed in this particular passage? Is it God's love for us? Is it, we're going to see these as we go through some examples, okay? The second one, Christ's whole life being a mystery of redemption. And that's an important turn for a lot of us because I think we're, we tend, even through our liturgical season, to go you know, through Easter or through Christmas, you know, the ordinary time is where now we come to Easter, and that's the time of redemption. Well, the catechism is kind of challenging that and saying, hey, folks, every aspect of Christ's life, and therefore every aspect of our liturgical year, is infused and filled with redemption. All we have to do is be looking to see it, right? As Jesus would say, for those who have eyes to see. And I want to try to help you to see that more clearly the remainder of tonight and then more next week. So revelation, redemption, and here's my favorite one on page four. Christ's whole life is a mystery of, don't be turned off by the big word here, recapitulation. Say it with me. Recapitulation. Now here's what it says. All Jesus did, said, and suffered had for its aim restoring fallen man to his original vocation. When Christ became incarnate and was made man, he recapitulated in himself the long history of mankind and procured for us a shortcut. And who doesn't like shortcuts, right? A shortcut to salvation. It's actually a very serious point. So that we, all that we had lost in Adam that is, being made in the image and likeness of God, we might recover in Christ Jesus. In many ways, this is just a a summary of the gospel, right? But it's also more than that. For this reason, the Catechism says, Christ experienced all the stages of life, thereby giving communion with God to all men. Here's what I think the Catechism is saying on this last one. It's saying that no matter where you look in the Gospels, there is some measure of recapitulation, of recovery, of renewal, of transformation, of restoring that which we were meant to be from the very beginning. Um, if you like, if you think of Jesus's, uh, or St. Paul's description of Jesus as the new Adam, it's getting very close to what recapitulation is. It's kind of like everything he does and says and is, is in some way symbolically, but really taking up the whole Old Testament and bringing it forward and raising it up to a whole new level. I actually like Bishop Barron's definition of recapitulation even better than the catechism one. I like the catechism one a lot. But here's what Bishop Robert Barron says. The notion of recapitulation, in Greek it's called anakephaleosis, goes all the way back, by the way, to St. Irenaeus. So this is not something the catechism just said, hey, let's, let's do this in 1994. It goes back to St. Irenaeus. He used the term in his writings, anakephaleosis, which kind of means uh, to put under the headings. Kephale means head, so it means to put under the headings, to reorder something. It's like taking a jigsaw puzzle, throwing it up in the air, and then taking all those pieces and reordering them, bringing them back to their harmony. That's what anakephaleosis is. That's what... Um, recapitulations. Okay, here's what he says. The notion of anakephaleosis, rendered in Latin as recapitulatio, is the master idea of Irenaeus' biblical theology. Okay, here it goes. Jesus draws all the strands of history and revelation together in himself, preserving and repeating them even as he brings them to fulfillment. That's a nice line worth underscoring or underlining. Jesus is taking all of natural history and all of salvation history of the Old Testament and drawing all that together in himself, preserving and repeating them even as he brings them to fulfillment or, if you like, perfection. So, uh, Robert Barron says, he is the new Adam, the one who participates fully in the reality of Adam. 
including physicality and alienation from God. I think of Jesus saying on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? Even as he draws all that was implicit and potential in Adam to completion. It's a very nice sentence. All that was potential in Adam. In other words, all that Adam could have been, right, but was not. Jesus completes and brings to perfection. Jesus, too, is the recapitulation of creation. This is where it gets really exciting. What, what Father Baron, Robert Barron is saying is that not only does Jesus recapitulate humanity, but all of creation. St. Paul says in uh, Romans, uh, when he looks forward to the second coming, he says, the whole creation is groaning, in Romans 8, the whole creation is groaning, right, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think he's tapped into the same mystery here that Father Barron's talking about that begins in Irenaeus. In his resurrection from the dead, Jesus heals, renews, and elevates the fallen world. And then he says this, the recapitulating Christ is himself the interpretive key of the whole scripture. The recapitulating Christ is the interpretive key to the whole scripture. Since he's the logos made flesh, the very embodiment of the regular fide in all of its dimensions. I know it's a lot there to, to ponder, but I think what what the Catechism is saying and what Father Barron, our Bishop Barron, are telling us is incredibly exciting news. They're telling us that Jesus has brought about and begun the new creation. And every action recorded in the Gospel of Mark and in the other Gospels is in some way endemic of his actions of recapitulation, whether we're talking about the baptism, the transfiguration, his miracles, his exorcisms, and particularly the passion narrative. And I'm going to show you a number of examples, and you have in your outline a number of examples of how this works. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get to it. I want to show you how we can go through the Gospel of Mark with an eye to these three R's of revelation, redemption, and recapitulation. I'm going to skip over some of the key characteristics of Mark, you can read those on your own, more about authorship, audience, structure, okay, as well as the symbols of the evangelists on page uh, four and five. Let's get to uh, page six. I want to get right to the baptism of Jesus. I need to ask you to open up your uh, Bible to Mark chapter one, verse nine. What I love about Mark so much is that he just thrusts us right into the action, right? Where Matthew and Luke give us kind of this prologue with um, the nativity and the genealogies and all of that, right? They get right to the heart of the matter. How does it begin? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just affirms the statement of his divinity right off the bat, right? And then we get the um, little bit of a prologue about John the Baptist. But let's look at the baptism of Jesus. In those days, Mark 1, verse 9, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Okay, now... The catechism in those three paragraphs we've been studying tells us that in every passage of the Gospels, we can find something of revelation, redemption, recapitulation. Now, I'm a bit of a doubting Thomas in some ways. And a couple years ago, I thought, nah, catechism is, you know, it's, of course, guiding us well, but it doesn't mean every passage. And so I took some time over the summer and went through the Gospel of Mark in the Greek and had the catechism out and checked for revelation, redemption, recapitulation. And I tell you, I found it over and over again in every chapter. So it's, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say these three things, the footprints and fingerprints are all over the gospel. So let's look at this passage. Well, let's start with the first, our revelation. What is the truth that is being conveyed in this passage? So without looking at the page, just, you know, what do you think? What, what's being conveyed here? Many things, right, about the baptism, right? Trinity. Yeah, well, that, that's one I think that for some people doesn't necessarily pop out. Some people say it's Jesus' divinity, right? God's voice is heard, right? But St. Augustine, 
says it so plain. Here's what he says. Here we have the Trinity presented in a clear way. The Father in the voice, the Son in the man, the Holy Spirit in the dove. And then he says, this only needs to be barely mentioned, for it's so obvious for anyone to see. I always say, well, talk to my seminarians. I'm like trying to pull this out of them at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's not always that obvious. But he's right, okay? Certainly Jesus is divinity, but this deeper point that Augustine wants us to ponder, the blessed Trinity. And it's not the only time that the voice from heaven will speak out. Do you know the other times that uh, the Father speaks? It's very rare. Anybody know the other time? Yeah, you guys are smart. This is a transfiguration. There's one other time it's recorded in John's gospel just before he's about to enter the upper room. So those are the three occasions. But you could say primarily in the synoptics, at least, it's the baptism and the transfiguration, these two key moments, right, where it's like the veil is pulled back and we're seeing the deeper identity of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, that's the first R. So far, we're in good shape. We've already, I think, discovered a lot with the help of St. Augustine. But what about redemption? We, you know, I know you want to trust the catechism. You're like, okay, this makes sense. But how is the baptism really redemptive? I know what Jesus, it was necessary for Jesus to be baptized because he entered into submission to his Father's will, and it became this act of renewal for all of us. But how is it redemptive? Well, consider what the catechism says. The baptism of Jesus is on his part the acceptance and inauguration of his mission as God's suffering servant. He's already the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hold a finger at Mark 1 and turn with me, please, to John chapter 1. John does not actually record the baptism of Jesus, but he kind of puts us right in the scene nevertheless. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, St. John the Evangelist records this. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him, saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay? So this image or symbol of redemption, right? The Lamb was the primary sacrifice offered in the Jerusalem temple for atonement of sin. And that's exactly how he identifies Jesus Christ right off the bat. But we can go further. The Catechism says, back to our outline, already Jesus is anticipating, watch this phrase, the baptism of his bloody death. Turn over to Mark chapter 10 with me. And in Mark 10, we read something rather astonishing. In Mark chapter 10, verse 38... Jesus is um, engaging his disciples. Let's pick it up in verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Oh, my. (laughs) And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, he's not talking about the water baptism. That's already happened back in Mark chapter 1. And they said to him, we are. So he's, he's going to explain, right? They say we are, right? Got to love the, the apostles, right? Early on there. <laughs> we are able. Jesus said to them, you will be baptized, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So Jesus is talking about this deeper mystery of of his death, right? Now, turn with me to one more passage, and it's Romans chapter 6. What's amazing about these three hours is when you start hunting and and searching for the answers, you're going to move all through the Scripture, Old and New Testament, and find out some amazing um, correlations. So Romans chapter 6, still on this notion of baptism as redemptive. And Paul gives a little catechesis here on what baptism is. Uh, Let's pick it up in verse uh, 3, chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Again, 
there's the New Testament talking about baptism in relationship to death. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. It goes on to say death no longer has dominion over him. Okay, so all that is to say that when we study Jesus' baptism, right, before we come to the notion of our own baptisms, which we ought, we have to come to terms with the fact that in some way it's already preparing for his crucifixion, which Mark's gospel himself sets as a deeper baptism, the baptism of Christ's death. Um, As I said, I just got back from the Holy Land, and uh, this is my eighth time there. It's hard to believe. One of my previous times, I watched a baptism of an Eastern Rite uh, Catholic a boy, about 12 years old, on Mount Carmel, the Mount Carmel, and a lot of you have been there. And in that church, we were there just to kind of pray in Elijah's cave, but there was a baptism going on, and it was kind of a full immersion baptism. So I'm like, oh, I'm staying for this. So we're watching it, and um, I'm not sure what right it is. We didn't get to talk to the, to the priest, but the boy went down into the water. I mean, he went down into the water, and he was there for a good long, you know, seemed like a long time. And the priest br- brought him back up, and we were like... <gasps> You know, that kind of gasp of, you know, because it's not like the sprinkling. It's like, oh, my gosh, you know. And it occurred to me that that image of immersion baptism really looks to the naked eye like a kind of a kind of a death, right? Going down under the water is a kind of a symbol of death, going down to death. And rising back up is exactly that, being brought up from the dead. And I think that there's a mystery here for us to contemplate when we come to Jesus' baptism that we, too, need to recover and help other Catholics, especially parents, to recover when we come to a baptism. Because I think so often we can be caught up with the ritual and the aesthetics and the beauty and the after party, which is all wonderful. I've been there myself several times with my daughters. But to return to this deeper, profound truth that already Jesus' first actions of going down into the water anticipate his death on our behalf that we might live in him. And that's a very beautiful, I think, powerful reminder. So we have revelation, we have redemption. Now, what about the third one, recapitulation? Well, I think there's a couple of things to see, a couple of possibilities that we might see from the Holy Scriptures. There's, I think, as always in Scripture, a multitude of meanings that are possible. The Church Fathers taught us that. So I submit not one, not two, but possibly three different ways that Jesus is recapitulating right? History. Let's take the first one. Um, Jesus's baptism, in a sense, recapitulates the creation in Genesis. Go back to Genesis 1 for a moment with me. In Genesis chapter 1, just turn there for a moment. And no, it's not word for word, but for those with eyes to see, I think it's unmistakable that Jesus's baptism takes us back to the very creation of the heavens and the earth, right? Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, just as the Spirit hovers over the Lord's own body as he comes out of the waters. In some sense, it's as if I think the Gospels are telling us the new creation has already begun with Jesus being plunged down into the waters. Another way I think recapitulation is at work here is circumcision, which was a kind of a bodily mark or bodily seal on male children, right? And in some sense, baptism is that new circumcision. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2, see what St. Paul once again says on this cord. Romans 2, verse 29 Start at 25. For circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes what Paul calls uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, law will not, uh, will not his cir- uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision. Jumping down to verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one 
outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, Paul writes, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. In some sense, I think Jesus' action is taking that earlier sign and raising it up to a new level. Remember, baptism is for all believers, where in the Old Testament, circumcision was reserved for the few, for young boys, males. His baptism, as the early church would preach, was for everyone to be cleansed, to be renewed, to be brought into Christ's kingdom. So I think it's another connection back to that. And the last one I think is really neat. Where exactly is Jesus baptized? Not just at any river, but at the Jordan River. What happens in the Old Testament at the Jordan River? Finally, the Israelites, after 400 years of captivity and slavery, cross over into the land that was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Jesus enters into the Jordan. He doesn't cross it, but that's not the point. The point is he enters into that mystery. It's as if he's saying, I am with all of Israel, plunging into these very same historic waters, just as our forefathers did, except I do so to bring about a new creation. By the way, just as an aside, do you remember when the manna fed the Israelites throughout the wilderness period? When did the manna stop? When they crossed over. Joshua tells us this in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 5, excuse me. No longer needed the manna from heaven because they were at the land of milk and honey. And by the way, what did the manna, these wafers, taste like? In Exodus, we're told that they tasted like a taste of honey, a down payment, a promise, a provision each time they took it of what was ahead. In some sense, I think this scene of baptism helps us to understand what the catechism is talking about. Now, I just picked, you know, one passage here, but we're going to go through more of these in our remaining time tonight and next week. And I think what's exciting about the three R's is you don't need to have a, a PhD or a master's degree. You just need to have a prayerful heart, an open Bible, a catechism, maybe a Bible dictionary can help, but you don't need all, a lot of fancy stuff. You can, you can do so in simplicity with the heart of a disciple. You may not always exhaust all the possibilities, but I think your Bible study in using these three R's will take a new shape and a new life. You're going to be looking at new passages in a fresh light and saying, wow, I never really thought about the composition of this story in such a way, and now I think it can help to kind of bring it together too, because passage after passage after passage will emerge with new and fresh insights. But have your catechism with you, because we always want to be checking our own values and judgments against the teaching and tradition of Holy Mother Church. All right, ready for one more? Let's do the temptation. Uh, Again, in Mark's gospel, in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, just a couple of verses there. Of course, it also occurs in Matthew and in Luke, a longer version in Matthew and uh, in Luke as well, and chapter 4 of both of those Gospels. Here it's just two verses. Mark 1, verse 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. You get more of the detail, obviously, from, and you have the text there you can look at later tonight or before next week. Let's talk about the three R's here. What about, what do you think? Revelation, what is being revealed? What's the truth? Well, with some help from the catechism and other sources, I think we can say this. What's being revealed clearly in this, in this scene, remarkably important scene, is, of course, that Jesus the Lord remains sinless. Yes? He undergoes temptation but remains sinless. Listen to what Hebrews says. Turn with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 4, verse um, 15. There's another amazing book, uh, the letter of Hebrews. And Hebrews 4, verse 15, says it this way. We have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our own weaknesses. He says that's not what we have. 
but one who in every respect, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Okay? There's lots of ways you can articulate that. That's the way Hebrews does it. But even in our own language, I think we understand and can embrace the core of what is being shown to us in this passage. Jesus remains faithful. He remains sinless, even while he undergoes such incredibly powerful temptations. In fact, in the other Gospels, it talks about how the devil left for a more opportune time to come at him once again, right? Just as he will do so for us. We must remain vigilant and prayerful in our lives. Okay, that one I think is straightforward. What about redemption? How is this scene redemptive? Again, scratch the head, right? You say the redemption is the cross, but the catechism is saying, no, every passage has something, some measure of redemption in it. I think this one is also very clear once we look at it with eyes to see. Jesus is the perfect Israelite. If you look back at the story of Israel, it's a very um, bittersweet story, right? Of trying and falling, of trying and falling again and again and again. Whether it's with the time of Moses, the wilderness, Joshua, all through his history. Here's what the catechism says. Jesus fulfills Israel's vocation perfectly. It's like he's there with um, Moses and the Israelites are making the golden calf and all the other scenes. He's standing there with them, right? Except while they yield and succumb to temptation, he stands there warding off the devil with the word of God, just as he does with us. In contrast, the catechism says to those who had once provoked God during the 40 years in the desert, Christ reveals himself as God's servant, totally obedient to God's will. And that, my friends, is redemptive in spades, right? You can look at it another way. What Jesus does on the cross, I think, is shot through, back through his entire life. So all these scenes take on a new light of redemption. Catechism isn't saying um, that the cross is not the pinnacle of redemption. It is. I think what the catechism is saying is when you really understand the profundity of Jesus' redemption on the cross, then you go back to the Gospels and in reverse, every scene becomes saturated with a new layer and impact of redemption. Even this scene, right? It restores, it renews, it reinvigorates our own hope and desire to remain faithful even when everything in us is pulling us in some other direction. N.T. Wright put it this way. He said, Jesus was the perfect Israelite doing for Israel what she could not do for herself. Finally, recapitulation. What happens in this grand scene? Yes, we know Jesus remains sinless. He shows himself as the perfect man and perfect Israelite. But I think it goes deeper. It goes all the way back to Adam, does it not? Remember, back in that original scene in Genesis 3, who comes at Eve and at Adam? But the serpent who is a disguised form or symbol of Satan himself. And both Eve and Adam fall and fall very, very badly, right, to those temptations. Let's go back to Genesis 3 just quickly before we, uh, I get the nod here. <laughs> Um, Genesis chapter 3. Let's dive right into the scene between serpent and Eve. Did God actually say you should not eat of the tree of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Wait a second, Eve. God never said that in Genesis 2 about touching it. Where's that coming from? Possibly... Your own brain? Who knows, right? But it does seem as though we're getting something into the interior life of human freedom, human freedom being pushed to the limit. Her little statement there says a lot. Does she want to touch it? Has she thought about it? God didn't say anything about that. That idea had to come from somewhere else. In any case, the serpent says to her, verse 4, you will not die. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, I got news for you, Satan. They're already like God. 
made in the image and likeness of God. See, when temptation comes, it spins us all around. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, number one, delight to the eyes, number two, and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took an eight and gave some to her husband. St. John calls these three temptations the threefold temptation, right? That's what they are. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. Well, here's what's fascinating. When you go to the temptation narrative in the other Gospels, in Matthew and in Luke, if you look at them very carefully, and I encourage you to do so, you will see that in every scene that Jesus is tempted, there is a kind of temptation to the flesh, to the eyes, and to pride. I'm not going to read them here, but I ask you to go ahead and look at them on your own, and you will see them very clearly. And at every turn, Jesus rebuffs them, right? The sensual appetite, right? Uh, the pleasure of the eyes, and the pride. All this will be yours, right? What's happening, I think, is that the Gospels are taking us back to Eden with Jesus Christ, the new Adam. And we're beginning to see with new eyes through St. Mark, as well as the other evangelists, what it looks like when the new Adam faces such temptations. By the way, a little aside, since Lent will be coming up sooner than we know, right? If you look at the, 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 the church's three traditions of Lent, right? Of prayer, fastings, and almsgiving, each one of those is directly connected to Jesus' temptations. In other words, when you study those temptations, what you begin to see is Jesus' actions and behavior and attitude, perfectly submitted to the Father, also give us great nourishment for our spiritual disciplines. When we're tempted by um, our sensual appetites, right, it seems intuitive to eat. You know, you're hungry, eat, you know, get a Big Mac, right? Jesus' answers are counter-cultural and counterintuitive to that. Fast. Put your mind on the spiritual food, right? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So there's an interesting connection between that original scene in the garden Jesus is recapitulating them in his own actions and rebuffing the devil and teaching us through the ministry of the church and these great Lenten disciplines about how to turn, with God's help, temptation into victory. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. The apostles will receive through the Holy Spirit the authoritative power of Jesus' own word, which has a lot for us to take away as well, right? We must contend with what the church teaches us and not simply you know, decide what we're going to swallow, what we're not going to swallow. Jesus' word is, is truth and revelation and authoritative. So is the apostles and the church. Second, quickly, redemption. With this inaugural announcement of the kingdom of God, the good news in Jesus Christ, we anticipate his sacrificial and redeeming death, accompanied by not his first words, but his last words. And you should check out the last word in this gospel of Jesus in Mark 15, 34. And finally, what is being recapitulated? After all, he's just getting started. What's he recapitulating? Well, I think we could say It's the whole notion of the kingdom of God. Boy, I wish we had half an hour to talk about that. But in 90 seconds, let's just, let me give you the short version. If you go back to the prophet Daniel, turn with me quickly to Daniel chapter 2, and we'll end here. Daniel chapter 2, one of the major prophets, is given a very fascinating and important task. Interpret the dream of this pagan king. Now, Daniel takes up that task very boldly, very faithfully, and says there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he can reveal to you through me what this dream is about. Daniel chapter 2, um, verse 27 and 28, he says, No wise men, no enchanters, no magicians, astrologers can show to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the mystery that the king has asked, what your dream is about, but there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Okay, and then he goes on to describe the dream. 
In verse, bless you, in verse 29 through 34, Daniel chapter 2. And I'll summarize it for you. What you have in that passage is a dream in which there's a giant statue. The top of the statue, the head of the statue is gold. The next part, basically the chest and torso, is made out of silver, the legs out of uh, bronze, and then finally the last part out of iron. And while there's some debate about what the particulars are, it seems that these are the earthly kingdoms of the ancient world. Babylon, Persian Empire, the Greek empires, and the Roman Empire, each corresponding to the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. And he describes this. He doesn't mention those kingdoms, but most scholars are pretty convinced that it's those four successive kingdoms. But now let's get to the, to the end of it here. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Daniel writes, In those days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up, here it comes, a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break into pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain with no human hand, we might say a heavenly stone, and that it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. Folks, there is in miniature the story of the coming of Jesus' kingdom. The earthly kingdoms each fall, ba-boom, 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 one on top of each other, and they're replaced by a small stone, not made by hands, which is like that mustard seed which will begin to grow and fill the earth. That is the kingdom of God I think this is what Jesus is getting at, is it is now finally here. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.